Okay, hey. welcome. Hi. How are you guys? Good. Good. Nice to come in from a time of worship. Why don't we start out with uh, some prayer and go right into a love cycle, and then we'll talk a little bit about the last week that we've had and what we've been learning. So, Lord, we come before you, and we praise you for this divine appointment in your presence. We praise you for what you're doing in our heart and our lives, and that you're the author and finisher of our faith, Lord. You're the one that gives us faith, and you call us into intimacy to walk with you and partner with you. So we are asking right now in the name of Jesus for your power to come, for your will to be done in our lives and in our thoughts, Lord. And to show us how to cooperate with you and what you're already doing inside of us, Lord. We say yes to agreeing with you, and we say no to agreeing with the lies of the enemy. And pray, Lord, that you would awaken us to the influence that you've given us, that we might abide in you and thrive in you and walk in life and walk in contentment and joy and sacrifice and giving and the abundance that you have for us. We ask all this in your name, Lord. Go ahead and take a deep, long breath right now just to the Lord's presence. Focus on just being here. Let go of what happened earlier today. Let go of tomorrow. And just focus on this moment right now in the present. And this says you quiet yourself. I want you to begin to observe what's going on in your emotions. If there's any tension in your body, you might want to identify that. If you're feeling a little stressed out or distracted, be aware of that. And observe your thoughts. What has made you feel that way? What have you been thinking about today? And can you hear or observe what the Holy Spirit is saying to you right now? Just take deep, long breaths and calm down as we kind of nestle onto the Lord's lap right now. And make a conscious decision with the Lord that, Lord, I want to volunteer for your work in my life. I'm going to volunteer for being for me. And you might just want to tell yourself that you forgive yourself for not being perfect. And receive the Lord's pardon. Receive His smiling face, His favor upon you. And go with His gentle love for you right now. Cooperate with Him in befriending and loving you. And those needs that you have that you've been maybe stressed out about, go ahead and and lift those up to the Lord and let Him be the one that carries those heavy burdens. Now just enter into His rest. He has said, come unto me and find rest. That my yoke is easy and it's light. Let him carry all the heaviness of your life right now. Let him carry the heaviness of your disappointment. I know the rest of his promises that everything you need, he has thought of and provided for. And Lord, we praise you that you are our good shepherd. That the path after you is a good path, Lord, that leads to green pastures and overflowing blessings. And even when it goes in dark valleys, Lord, your protection and your guidance is with us. So we commit our souls and our hearts to you and and Lord we give you our heart in our heart's pursuit for life we enter into your rest and turn ourselves to you tonight have your way with us and teach us 
Thank you for your presence. And uh, thank you for reminding us, Lord, that you are all we really need, that you've given us all we need. Thank you for your work that you're doing now. And we, we say yes, and we bless your hand. And, and thank you, Lord, that um, all things in our lives that we can't see, that we can't control, you can, and you do know what you're doing, and you do know the way, and you're leading us, and you're faithful to complete your good work in us. So we let go of all those other thoughts and all those other emotions that would lie to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that always feels good. So last week, just by way of review, uh, we talked about the critic within. And that a lot of our self-talk, the critic seems to be autopiloting some negative things, but the critic has less control than we know. In fact, what, what we went through is some steps where we're dialing in and hopefully using the love cycle during the week and just becoming more aware of our thoughts and our emotions and monitoring our thoughts and catching the critic while he's or she is beating us up. And then we, learned, we talked about unmasking uh, the critic. In other words, that even though uh, it's very negative for our self-esteem and we get beat up, sometimes the critic helps relieve some stress for us. Like maybe we might be afraid of being disappointed or rejected or motivate ourselves to get to do something. So we'll, we'll be employing the critic. And we decided that we're going to take our knees to Jesus instead. And we're going to agree with God's version of reality instead of uh, listening to those scary lies and break the, the bad agreements that we can often make in a vulnerable moment when we're feeling inferior or inadequate or hopeless and that voice comes and says, this isn't going to work out, God's abandoned you or you're a failure, that in those vulnerable moments we can, we can have a temptation to go, yeah, you're right, and make an agreement with an enemy of ourselves and of the Lord. And um, we talked a little bit about talking back. So we're going to get more into this tonight, but your assignment this week was to really... Focus in on your awareness of your self-talk. And what I want to ask you guys, if, uh, if you can share with me, what have you been noticing uh, this past week in your self-talk? Have you caught the critic? Have you un figured out how the critic is maybe serving you? Have you uh, been using the love cycle? Share with me your results, good, bad, and different. Give me some feedback. traumatic events happen and have been very unsure, uh, you know, about a lot of things. So there was this lot of, you know, I know it was, a, you know, all, all that got shaky, you know, and it was kind of like, so I became uh, uh, kind of subject to the critic's voice because I wasn't sure of, not God, but who I was in God. Yes. You know, I became unsure of that. I wasn't quite sure because I took such a, you know, so... I had been listening to one voice and had been doing a pretty, pretty good job and, um, to the point where my immediate response was, you know, would be fear and this overwhelming fear and like, um, if I've done wrong, I, you know, I need, I, you know, I don't need to, I, you know, because you don't want to hurt anybody, you don't want to offend anybody, so you're just going to remove yourself from the whole situation, even if it's the church. Find another church. Don't go back to that class. You know, da 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 da. Because you, you, you yeah. know, the critic has gone. You, you. And I really was like, I and you know, and I went up, I went upstairs to my mom, and I go, you know what? I will not. I am not going to listen to this. <laughs> not for the evening. Not for the week. Good I am you. not going to do this. And normally, I just would not. I just would let it take its course and yeah. you know, just be beat up for days. You know. Until, you know, uh, and so I went straight to a person who, 
who somebody had said, you know, I pray too loud. And so, me? <laughs> so, I, uh, but what I did was I went to the head person and I, they said, well, of course not. You know, she, she said, you don't play, but no, you didn't play. And so I, I you know, I was like, and it, I immediately got released. But the whole idea to check it. Yes. Instead of just letting it just, you know, because I mean, I'm getting ready to move churches now. You know, wow. I'm feeling yeah. like I'm offending people and they don't pray my way here. And, you know, mm. and I'm too loud and, you know, so I need to just move on. And I go, you know what, it's just too critical. I just got out of class saying, watch this kind of stuff. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I checked with the leader that was there in that, first, in that, in that prayer circle. And they, I was told, no, not at all. And so I told the person, I said, well, the leader said no, and she, and the person even told me, she said, I'm glad you took care of yourself. Um, it just really did so much for me, I mean, as far as, uh, you know, it gave me a lot of strength, a lot of, a lot of uh, settled on the inside, mm -hmm. you know, and then I realized that, you know, don't, you, that I didn't have to go around being like, agreeing with whatever the critic said, and that this critic was wrong. And, you know, and, um, and that everybody was different, and I had my own right to my own uniqueness, even though ultimately there's nothing unique about it, you know. And so, uh, uh, you know, I really got through, and I mean, it, they've been really, really bad. And, you know, all the, all, the, all the critic wants you to do is just really step out on that mess and actually change your life around based on what the critic says. True. You know, so that, so that the damage can really get done then. You right. Know? <laughs> right, yeah. Well, that's good. Thanks for sharing. That's really important to, to, to check it out and not just take the bait. Yeah, I didn't just take the bait. Yeah, that's, right. that's what happened. <laughs> Somebody else, what have you noticed this week? I have a tendency to replay old conversations or old, um, old things. Yes, yeah, over and over and over. And uh -huh. over. Like, oh, man, I should have said that, or oh, I should have just done this. Right. But this week, I was able to finally just, oh, all right, I get it now. This week, I was like, okay. Because normally, I'll just keep going over and going over it until I'm distracted by my kids or whatever. Uh -huh. And finally today, um, I was in my room, and I was doing laundry, and it, I was playing, like, an old conversation, and I was like, oh, okay, okay. Well, okay, so you realized what was happening. I was like, all it's going to do is put me in a bad mood, get me depressed, and I don't need that. So Good for you. Yeah. It took me so sad. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it does take a while, but it's well worth it. Anybody else want to share? What you're experiencing, what you're noticing? How many of you have had a chance to use the love cycle on your own? Let me get a show of hands. One, two, three. How has that been for you guys? It's been pretty good, actually. Uh, uh, we were traveling this past week, and I, uh, I had to leave my kids at home. Mm -hmm. So I was guilty about it, mm -hmm. and I felt like so many things on me. And I was criticizing me, criticizing me a lot, and I was like, no, remember what I told you guys? Breathe, so I tried to relax, good. and then try to try to find out why I was feeling so bad and, and, and awesome. get all the little things that was bothering me. So I did practice and it helped, you know, to realize that I was thinking wrong. Just okay. try to focus on the positive. They're okay, they're in good hands. So try to focus on the positive instead of the, the negative things. So, and it worked really good. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. I saw some other hands. Anybody else? Willing to share your experience with Rhonda? I find that when I first start, I'm rushing through to get fixed and go into the next thing. Okay. L O V E. And it helps me. <laughs> and, and that's not the purpose at all. Hmm. Um, I mean, it is for healing to make whatever I'm in the middle of be better, but it's about being in the moment. It's about being in the moment during that, too. Yes. Uh -huh. Really makes it long and it just gave me time to dwell in each step. Good. Kind of was more powerful, I think, for me. Good. Not that I do that all the 
Awesome. Thank you. For those of you who don't know, there's a couple hours of, of video content that I have online that you can get to 24-7. Uh, you can either go to awakenedinfluence.com and there's a, a link on the first page. Uh, but it, the, the actual site I'll take you to, I've called it lovehealsdepression.com. And this is kind of my evangelistic outreach for hurting people and get them from the being in the burn victim into love's presence and then introduce them to the Lord. So uh, some good content there, and I go through the love cycle. So it can be very helpful to have someone kind of talk you through it. I've actually listened to it myself. I'm like, this is good, this is good, because, you know, we forget. We need help. And, uh, you know, the content is Jesus. And, and we, we seem to, I seem to leak truth on a regular basis and need reminding. Um, have you ever written down like a good truth you heard from the Lord and then you find it later and you're like, that's good. <laughs> it's good to do. It's really cool when it's coming out of your mouth and you think to yourself, gosh, I ought to listen to this. this yes. <laughs> And, you know, I found that's, that's one of the great things about praying for other people. Uh, I've been in different prayer groups throughout the years, and th- sometimes I've just made myself go, and I feel really disconnected, and like I've got nothing to give. And um, Whoa. Uh-huh. Very sensitive here. Um, and, and somebody shares a need, and all of a sudden I'm like hearing God's voice and feeling compassion, and I'm praying for them, and I'm reassuring them in truth, and it's the same thing I need to hear. But it's so edifying to, to not just receive prayer, but to show up and find that God's willing to use you in your state of brokenness. And as he's flowing in you and through you, you're getting healed and, and you're being reminded of the truth and faith is coming up in you and in them. And so our goal is to really notice whether we're emotionally underwater or we're feeling above the water and to continue to Pay attention to God and His Spirit and enter into that sanctuary within and enter that conversation and invite Him in. And uh, that's what the love cycle is really all about. It's just a simple way of learning how to practice the presence of God and how to parent ourselves in that process and how to uh, you know, be aware that we actually are pretty mean to ourselves a good amount of the time and to stop it and to align with the Lord instead. So this is the journey that we're on, and tonight we're going to talk about the myth of seeing reality. So we rely on our senses, right? You're a little kid, you reach out, you touch something that's hot, and ow, you burn your finger and you realize what hot is. You touch something that's cold or hard or soft, and you learn over time to to trust your senses that what I think this is, is actually what it is. Now, that, that, that works pretty good with inanimate objects. Uh, we're able to do that. But um, what happens is we develop this trust in our ability to perceive accurately. And I'm sure you've never gotten in an argument with a friend and said, this is how it went. No, it isn't. This is how it went. No, it isn't. This is how it went. Have you ever seen couples been married for a long time and they'll argue about a memory? <laughs> My folks used to do that a lot. So... When, my wife and I got married and we were writing our own vows. One of them is, I will hold you more important than me being right. Because, you know, nobody wins in those arguments, right? But we come to trust in, in, in what they tell us. The problem is, is when it comes to human perception, our brains are so powerful that often what we are expecting to see and what we have seen in the past will affect what we think we saw. That sounds like a confusing sentence. Let's see here. So, so what, what you expect to see and what you've seen in the past will affect what you think you're seeing now. In other words, um, our emotional state, how we're feeling, will affect what we're seeing. Uh, our self-talk, our assumptions about life, our attitudes will affect what we're seeing. Let's say that you've got a belief, uh, an assumption that all green people are thieves and liars. And you go to a waiting room for some appointment and um, you come back and you've misplaced your purse or your wallet. What's your first assumption? Which green person took it? That's how you're going to see, 
right? It's not like, oh, where did I leave it? Uh, this happens in my house. My wife is usually the one who puts things back in their place, so when my daughters or I can't find something, where'd she put it? Where'd, where'd V put it? And normally, we just misplaced it, right? Uh, our beliefs will affect what we're willing to see and perceive and filter, and our prejudgments will do the same thing. So, for instance, uh, let's say that here's a picture of a dog, and a uh, rather large dog, and if you're a dog lover and you've had good experience with dogs, this is what's on your computer screen. Um, okay? And, and I've got a big dog, and I enjoy going around, and they're friendly, and they'll come up and say hi to some people. But some people, what they have on their screen is this is how they see that dog. Now remember, the real dog looks like this. But the perception is either this or... Look at those teeth, man. Skull-crushing teeth. <laughs> and some people have been bitten by dogs. They've been terrified as a youngster. And when they see a dog, this is all that they see. Right? Uh, same thing on uh, heights. You, you, we could take a trip to the Grand Canyon, go to the north side, and get up and look down 7,000 feet. And uh, maybe we want to really look at the details. So say, well, come sit with me on the edge. We'll hold on to the railing so we'll be safe. And we'll just sit and dangle our feet over. Are some of you feeling a little anxious? No. Yeah. Some, some, you know, no problem. I'm safe. I'm enjoying the view. So our internal screens is what is going to affect our perception of reality. So there's some rules about this. Is first of all, we all have that internal screen that we're viewing life through. You cannot not view life completely objectively. Just ask any peace officer that's been on the scene after an accident and they'll interview three or four witnesses and they will get three or four completely different accounts of what just happened because we're all seeing through our screen. Secondly, is uh, what we've touched on already is that the contents of what we have on our screen is filtered and edited all the time by our past experiences, good dog, bad dog, Afraid of heights, comfortable with heights. Mom yelled at me. I'm always in trouble. Um, I always, I seem to have this innate. I'm in trouble. Like, have you ever had a, a superior authority come to you and says, "Can you come to my office? We need to talk." Where do you go? Uh oh, uh -oh it's me. What did I do? And you're kind of tense for the first few minutes of the conversation until you figure out it's not about you. <laughs> So we filter and we edit these things, so that means that what we're seeing on our screen is not actual reality. Even the sanest, most logical, most objective person on the planet has some distance between reality and what they're perceiving on their screen. You can only see what's on your screen and you can only see yours. When you're talking to somebody else, there's no way of knowing what's on their screen. Have you ever had someone react to you really volatile in a way and you're talking about something you feel is kind of neutral and all of a sudden they're getting all hot and bothered and you're wondering where this is coming from? It's on their screen. You know, I, I've had certain issues with authority in my life and I didn't realize everybody else has issues with authority until I came on staff here some years ago and then all of a sudden people were having problems with me and I realized it's the authority thing, not me. I'm one of you. You don't have to feel this way about me, but it was me, it was their screen. So we are doing this. And your self-talk will interpret what's on your screen. It's like that voice over. Everything that you're seeing, you're getting a voice commentary on what it is. And you cannot trust what you're seeing fully. This is what we really need to stop and step back and say, wait a minute, I believe I'm seeing it this way, but I've got to be cognizant of the fact that I may not be perceiving very accurately. Maybe they didn't mean that when they said that to me. Maybe they really weren't that evil or after hurting me or, you know, whatever it might be. I may not have perceived it right. And let me take a step back. And, and we have to uh, move into maturity by doing the same things with our emotions. We can have an emotion and realize that emotions sometimes have little to do with factual situation. So we have to kind of stop in that parenting ourselves 
and take a step back. Remember, um, the difference between us and, and animals, Maslow said, is the stimulus pause response. Most animals are stimulus response. We ha have that higher cognitive ability to the stimulus comes in, we can take a pause. And in that, we can make a choice. We have influence over what we're going to do with that perception, what we're going to do with that thought before immediately going into an emotional reaction, which may be inaccurate. So our internal screens, the grid through which we are perceiving things, are really important. Uh, and that's the reality check that we want to talk about, is we only see what's on our screens, not reality. So I want to talk about some common screen distortions. Okay? And psychologists call these cognitive distortions. And all these are is they're habits of thought that are poor habits of interpreting reality. So reality is out there, and we can interpret it in a poor way. And so I'm, we're going to go through about eight of these. You don't have to memorize them, but covering them will start giving you some tools to talk yourself off the ledge sometimes when you need to be talked off the ledge. You feel like you're going to jump? No, stop. So the, these really, though, they cut us off from reality, and they can really mess up our, our happiness. They can mess up our relationship with the Lord. They can mess up our relationships with other people because we're not responding to reality. We're responding to these things on our screens. So the first one I want to talk about is overgeneralization. Overgeneralization will come in the form of rules. So, for instance, you make one mistake, and you're like, I'm incompetent. Um, I'm, I'm always a screw up or I'll never amount to anything. I'll never get to work on time. I'll never get over this habit. I'll always have low self-esteem. And so it's a label that we paste on things that uh, becomes a rule and often we don't even test that rule. You know, that person, it will never be trustworthy. Was that really true? Maybe someone's let you down, they've proven untrustworthy. Is it true that they'll never be trustworthy again? No, but we put a label on it. We could do this with rich people, poor people. We could do this with people that make us uncomfortable. We can do this to a relationship. We can do this to other churches. We can do this to non-believers. And look out for uh, overgeneralization if you are finding yourself using... Uh, Terms that are like all, none, no one will understand me, everyone is against me, um, all these absolutes of always and nevers. It's like it's black and white. There's no medium, there's no mix, there's no gray. If, if that's happening, that's a good sign that you're generalizing. And just name calling in general. You know, I'm, I'm an old gimp would be <laughs> overgeneralization. You got that one? Anybody identify with this one? I do, okay. Everybody else? You're in denial. <laughs> Another poor habit of interpreting is uh, global labeling. Global labeling is a little bit different in that if we place a stereotypical label to whole classes of people, things, behaviors, and experiences. You know, all the people in that organization are hypocrites. All the people over there are just money-hungry sinners. Um, all BMW owners are... Yeah, all BMW owners are... All Mercedes owners are stuck up. Until you get to own one yourself. And then, then they're okay. So they're negative cliches. Typically, though, about your appearance. Uh, about your performance. And about your intelligence. So... These really are the methodology of the pathological critic. So we're getting a little bit deeper now into some of Satan's tactics, uh, the enemy, how it works inside of us. And that would sound like, I'm just a failure, or my house is a pigsty. My life is a mess. I'll never get it together. Uh, I'm just a quitter. Or even, I've got an inferiority complex. Wow. Can someone like instill those in us and then we like keep that on our screen? Absolutely. Uh, this is happening uh, like a, an authority figure, a parent, 
um, a friend, somebody else can put a label on you and then you wear that and reinforce that and hear it and accept it. Remember, these, this, this is going off in the self-talk at 300,000 words a minute. Um, the thing about these poor habits of interpreting these cognitive distortions is that we often just assume that they're true. They've been living with us so long and they, they, when they are spoken and when they're felt, when we're thinking about it, it just feels like this is the way things really are, so we take that bait and we swallow it. Well, we've got to learn not to do that. Good question. Any other questions? Filtering. Filtering is a favorite for most of us. Now, filtering this way is uh, usually in a negative sense, but filtering means you can see and hear only certain things. So, for instance, you might be filtering for un unworthiness in yourself. Uh, oftentimes, I notice whenever I do some sort of public speaking, uh, I will review it afterwards, and what I will filter for is everything I did wrong, or things I forgot to say, or didn't explain, or said it in a funny way, and then I'll come away from that experience feeling what? What, and, and what I will omit is, oh, wow, I had courage to get up there and do it. And, wow, the Lord laid down some serious truth. And, and, wow, some connections were made. It's like all that just doesn't seem to matter anymore. All I filter for and focus on is that negative thing. Think of, think of this like a, a movie camera. And there's a movie camera in your mind, and you can go around with that movie camera and zoom into certain things and pan out. And, and of all the positive and beauty that's around, we can tend to filter just for the negative. Where am I unhappy? Where do I not have enough? And we're going to dive into the power of questions in a future session where we want to take more control of what our camera is pointed at and what it is focusing on. Because there's plenty of beauty and good and right and truth. And that's why Paul says in the New Testament, you know, whatever is good, true, right, think on these things. But no. We like to filter for the negative. You could cook a beautiful meal for somebody, and you know all parts of the meal are wonderful, except the salad was a little wilty, and you know it wasn't the bread was undercooked, and the, oh, it's a terrible meal. You know, and it's not true. Uh, so oftentimes you'll notice you're filtering if you have a hard time hearing compliments, and you only remember your failings. If you've ever gotten a review from a superior and they can go through and say, well, here, you're doing this good, you're doing this good, you're doing this good, uh, but this area you're a little weak in and you need some improvement in, and you just go out feeling like someone deflated your balloon. You know you're filtering. It's not fair to you. You're not seeing reality. You're only taking in the negative, and whose will is that for you? Yeah, the critic. Satan. And we want to stop siding with that dude. Or her, <laughs> and it, and it's a detachment from reality because we lose track of the big picture. We lose track of seeing ourselves objectively. We only focus on that negative and the bad, and and this really it kills our self-esteem. It kills our heart. Discourages us from stepping out, from being all that we are called and created to be. And this is uh, the, one of the critics' main methods of shutting us down and keeping us down. So watch out for filtering. Anybody relate to this one? Good. And not so many in denial. Self-blame. Self-blame is you blame yourself for everything. It's all your fault. This is kind of an over-responsibility complex. So not only do you blame yourself for your shortcomings, but you blame yourself for others' reactions. Uh, your spouse or a friend may be upset, and instantly you feel like, oh, it's something I said or did or I didn't do. How can I make it better, honey? Or the econ Yes? Where does all that come from, and how do you stop it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're just recognizing it. We're going to get into how you stop it in a minute. Uh, where it's coming from really is the pit of hell. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we've joined in. 
and uh, we're waking up to this now. So, you know, the economy may go south, your company consolidates, and your position is eliminated, and you feel like it's, it's really all my fault. I just didn't work hard enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm unworthy. I'm speaking from experience on these things. Uh, you find yourself always apologizing. Um, and, and it blinds you to your good qualities and accomplishments. Self-blame. Anybody here identify with self-blame? Okay. Uh, another one, five, is personalization. Personalization is another personal favorite of mine. And that is that all events seem to have something to do with me. Narcissistic. You walk into a room and you instantly feel like everybody is looking at you and you're comparing yourself. You're talking with somebody at the office or a roommate or someone you live with and they're complaining about something in that environment. You know, I just hate it when people don't pull their weight around here. I hate it when people are late and leave a mess. You know, the other week I had to clean up a mess in the kitchen sink and you're like, they're talking to me. <laughs> and and you assume it's all because of you. And this can really mess up relationships, especially if they're just venting how they're feeling and you're taking it all personally and you come back at them with sort of an attack. Now you've just added a whole level of conflict to that relationship that didn't need to be there. <laughs> all because we get kind of narcissistic about it. And the other part of this is if you find yourself always comparing yourself to others, trying to find some barometer to measure up. Did I wear the right thing? Are they more needy or less needy than me? Uh, am I engaged enough? Am I smart or spiritually mature enough or working hard enough? This is all signs that you are really focused in on yourself and this keeps you paranoid. So, and it keeps you negatively self-focused rather than positively self-focused. Rather than, you know, accepting and embracing your uniqueness and that everybody has different strengths and that's like why Paul goes into all that detail about the body, right? Some parts of the body are made for different functions. So if you're a stomach, how are you going to feel about your performance if you're comparing yourself to the foot? Not very good, but you're not supposed to be the foot. So uh, sometimes, and we'll talk about some rebuttals, but some good things to say to this personalization is stop being so paranoid. It's not all about you, self Anybody identify with personalization? Good. And then mind reading. We all love mind reading. Our critic really helps us. Our critic, and what it is, the basis of this one is that you assume everybody thinks, feels, and judges just like you. It's actually a form of projection. That the way they see life is like you, the way they're going to respond to something is just like you, and they're, uh, you think everyone agrees with your negative opinion about yourself. So you may be very familiar with some negative aspect of yourself that I would have no idea or no clue. However, you may be talking to me or be in a group and think that that's what everybody else is seeing and everybody else is judging you for. When the reality is, most people are so preoccupied with what's going on in their own worlds that they're, they're hardly able to even pay attention to you and see you. <laughs> That's a good thing to keep in mind. <laughs> I won't tell you how I learned this, but I know it's true. <laughs> And, and again, it, it, will, it will go into places you don't want to go. You know, you'll be thinking, oh, he's cross because I was late and he's mad about it. And a lot of the remedies is, is that we're getting into in a minute is we're going to start to test these. We're going to start to check in and test them out and be a little bit more objective rather than just swallowing the bait. So... Be careful of mind reading. Not everybody thinks like you, assumes the same things, they don't have the same temperament, the way they're judging and evaluating situations are different. Uh, the, where this gets really poisonous is the more 
critical we are with other people and the more judgmental we are with others, guess what? Anytime you know, you're in a meeting and you think, man, I could have run that better, or gee, they, they really wasted time over here, or boy, what a slob. It, you know, you, it's a subconscious habit. It's uh, of the flesh. It's not of the spirit. It might make that comparison might make us feel a little better for the instant, and that's how it became a habit. But every time we render a judgment against somebody else, that is just arming our critic with ammunition to come gunning for us the very next time. And it's happening all the time. You know, if we see a terrorist do something we don't like and we judge them as morally wrong, watch out. <laughs> we'll get more into this later. That's kind of an advanced <laughs> lesson. But the more we judge, the more we are going to criticize and be judged ourselves. Remember Jesus says, don't judge lest you be judged. I always thought he was talking about God or other people. I think the first reality we run into is what we do to ourselves as we get so good at condemning and judging others. So um, oftentimes we know we're mind reading when you can just tell. No, I just know they're mad at me. I, I can just feel it. They don't like me. The other one is control myths. Control myth is either you are in charge of the universe <laughs> or everybody else seems to be in charge of the universe but you. So you can go either way on this one. Do you have a question? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, you struggle to control every situation. And uh, this, go this is great for kids. You know, you, everything your kids do is a reflection on you. you know, your, your guest experience at your party uh, is up to you. Like, wow, they didn't have a good time. It's all my fault. Or my kids' grades at school aren't what they should be. Man, that, that, is, that is totally under my control. I should be able to do something about that. Now, there's levels of influence that we have. But there's a lot of things that are just completely outside of our control. In fact, Stephen Covey does a... Um, in his, you guys ever remember Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Mm -hmm. He talks about the sphere of influence and the sphere of control. And the sphere of control can be relatively small. Things that we are directly control over. But we have this sphere of uh, concern, rather, that, you know, the economy, other people, what's going on, and, and we can spend a lot of time focused on that sphere of concern, and, and it just sucks us dry of energy because we really can't do much about it. And it takes us away from focusing on what we can control. But the more we focus on what we can control, the more we can influence what concerns us. So this control myth is important, and you'll find yourself feeling failure all over the place if you've got this control thing. It's kind of a perfectionistic. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a high to have this cognitive disorder because underneath it is this assumption that you're omnipotent. If I just worked hard enough, I could get it all together. Well, you're not God, which is kind of what that, that interpretation would say. And you'll find yourself saying things like, I have to get them to do this. I have to get them to agree. I have to get these group of people to move over in this direction. The last one we're going to cover is emotional reasoning. This is really a culprit. Emotional reasoning is that we just completely discount logic and interpret reality with our feelings instead. So all of a sudden, feelings now become dominant. Because in this situation, when we're interpreting reality this way, we are what we feel. So if you feel worthless, guess what? Oh, I must be worthless. If I feel hopeless, then I must be hopeless. If I feel unworthy or disqualified, then that, that just must be true. Keep in mind, these emotions feel so true but we disconnect from logic we disconnect from wait a minute I'm not hopeless I have all kinds of hope because God is good and therefore the future is good I'm not disqualified or unworthy God has made me qualified and has made me worthy by what he's done 
And so we have to step away from our emotions, just like our screens, and learn to question them. And, and realize that reality is not what we feel. We really do have to uh, see sometimes our emotions in our mind like that high-speed car without a driver. <laughs> the emotions will take it anywhere. It's a dangerous situation. We've got to slide over there and take the wheel and talk ourselves off the wall, as I've said. So the way out is some more healthy interpreting. So number one rule here is wait before you take the bait. Wait before you take the bait. Remember, uh, there's some advice on you know, anger management. Count to 10 before you respond if you're going to get angry. Same kind of concept. Stimulus pause before your response. So you tune in to notice your feelings and your thoughts. And this is where we get into the love cycle. Lift your head, take some breaths, and observe what's going on. Don't just jump in there and go, wait a minute, self, uh, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? Uh, what's going on in my self-talk? What's going on on the perception of my screen? You step back to objectively analyze what's really going on. And then you question what's really happening. And this is part of volunteering for ourselves. Is, is going, wait a minute, this, I may feel that this is so true and I may feel that this is so real, but uh, I need more input. What are the facts? What do I really know that's true that's happening here? Uh, would this stand up in a court of law? You know, if, if, we were, if we had a judge and an attorney and we were going through the facts, would it stand up to that kind of scrutiny of facts? Oftentimes it doesn't. It wouldn't stand up in court. So uh, we ask, your, ask ourselves and we ask Jesus, then what's true? What's true? What's reality? And it's important to ask ourselves, what worldview do I have right now? Is it God's version of the world, or is it some other version of the world? What I mean by this is we are confronted by the Holy Spirit through Scripture with a completely different interpretation of what's real and what's unreal. And we have to stop and understand that we are viewing life through sometimes a godless worldview. And we've got to ask ourselves, what am I expecting? Am I expecting that I'm alone? Am I expecting that evil wins? Am I expecting failure? What am I looking for? What have I been filtering for? So, is it God's victory that I'm tuned into? Or, Am I tuned into abandonment? Is that my worldview? What I found in my life, and, and really going through some testing by having my expectations violated, was that uh, I had to understand that the worldview that's dominant, programmed into my mind, is a godless worldview. And that's why spending time with the Lord, praying, being in the Word, worshiping, fellowshipping with other believers, and we have those aha moments. You know, we leak the truth, and we've got to fill up and go, well, no, wait a minute. What's really true is God's sovereign, and He holds it all. Not these other perceptions in my mind. So the active mindset and worldview, here's what the Bible, here's what God says by His Word is real, is that God exists. He is the great I Am, and His character is good, and God is love, and He is going to follow through on everything that He's promised, and because He's good, we can have confidence in life. Amen? Amen. That's the truth, right? Yep. Do you always feel that way? Yep. Even right now, is it like, really? <laughs> but we live by faith. John says the work of the disciple is to believe. Paul says we, we live not by what we can see, but by the unseen. So we, are, we, are, we do not get to live as just normal people any longer. We do not get to think, just as, and this is a privilege, because thinking like normal people is rather helpless and hopeless. To understand that we have been adopted 
by the King of kings and Lord of lords, that the lover of your soul has pursued you and will not give up till he has you, that you are a precious bride in his sight. Every hair in your head is numbered, that there is hope coming that cannot be stopped, that there is worth that you have that is so precious, it's beyond all silver and gold, it's worth the very life of the Son of God. Now, it's unreal. And where we tend to live too much of the time is in fear. What's the opposite of love? Is it hate? Or is it fear? John says, perfect love casts out all fear. If we're still afraid, what does he say? means we haven't yet discovered the love of God. Now that's sobering. Some of us may feel like we know God very well. I, I know I sometimes feel like I know God very well, but judging by the level of fear in my life, I'd say I've got a lot to learn about this incomprehensible one called God who is love itself. The other unreality that we tend to live in is abandonment. And this is the worldview of Satan and the critic. It's what he said to Adam and Eve. Did God really say, don't eat of that tree? Oh, you know what? He's holding out on you. <laughs> we thought so. He's going to abandon us. We've got to do something for ourselves. The unreal is hopelessness. Don't go see horror movies. Because they glorify Satan. They say that evil wins in the day and needs to be feared and has power over your, your life. Don't feed your mind, your subconscious on that. Certainly don't take young children to those kind of films. And worthlessness. How many messages of worthlessness are out there? It's everywhere. It's in the way we pass souls every day and walk right by them like they were a light post. I was standing in Kaiser last night waiting for a prescription, and someone turned around to me so close I couldn't believe it. It's like I wasn't even there. But yet we all do this to each other because we, we, we forget, like, oh, that's a, that's a brother, that's a sister, that's the, that's the, most, that's the crowning jewel of creation. You know, if, we, if we walked by a super expensive diamond or a really cool piece of art or an incredible sunset, like, oh, or like the tallest sequoia tree. <laughs> Wow, look at that thing, you know, but we walk right past each other because we're not living in reality. We're not living in this world view. So what we have to learn to do is to shift our thinking to agree with what God says is true about us and people and life and our future and to say no to what the enemy is saying about life, us, and the future. And to realize that we've got this negative programming inside of us. It's hardwired in our flesh. It's hardwired to take us in the wrong direction. Remember we started this series talking about Galatians 5. Paul says, you got the spirit and you got the flesh. And you are not free from this conflict the whole time you're here. This is the battleground and this is exactly where the battle takes place. So we looked at all those cognitive distortions, misperceptions of reality. Guess where they're coming from? unreal side so the way out is we align and we agree with God and his truth so we believe and we stand on his name you know Billy Graham made a commitment up at Forest Home one time he was kind of wondering which direction to go with his life and they have this rock up there with a plaque from him and this picture of him standing by it but he decided that he was going to take God and the word of God for exactly what it said and with that faith and with that conviction, he went out and started his Los Angeles evangelism missions. And the rest is history. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And what God is always saying is, abide in me and you'll produce much fruit. And we're like, well, thanks, God. I'll do it on my own. I'll produce my own fruit. I'm not good enough. Well, yeah, you're not. All you got to do is believe and stand on me and watch what happens. And, it, you know, this would be statements that we say to ourselves. This is what, and I've got a handout to give you as you leave tonight, is that God is always working his plan and his care would be what faith sounds like and a God full 
worldview instead of a godless worldview. And the scriptures are full of this. The Hebrew mindset was that the whole earth belongs to the Lord and is bathed with the presence of God. Uh, Joseph fell asleep, had the vision of the ladder from heaven, angels going up and down. He woke up and said, God is in this place and I didn't know it. And, and I think that's going to be the progressive revelation of our lives. God was in it, God was with me the whole time and I didn't know it. It would sound, faith statements like, I'm forgiven, I'm special, and I'm covered. Jesus has won the battle for me. God fights for me. So, secondly, talk back. Rebuke the liar and the lies. And it would sound like this. Baloney! That's not true. I'm accepted and can do all things in Jesus. Talking back, rebuking rules. I'm going to cover this quick because we're running short on time. They must be strong and they must be forceful. You do want to involve your emotions. You do want to say them out loud. You do want to plead the blood of Jesus. You often are talking to demonic entities. They are called rebellious spirits because they are rebellious. So tell them to shut up. It's what Jesus did all the time. Get away from me. Be quiet. Must be in his spirit. That's why the love cycle of volunteering is, is always trying to align us with the Lord. And it must be accepting and non-judgmental. So if you're going to make a statement about yourself uh, to counteract a negative statement, you can't say, well, I'm perfect all the time because I'm Superman, because that's not, this is not true. Um, you, you, you've got to be more objective. So instead of calling yourself stupid, Maybe you'd say, you got a C in algebra. Instead of calling yourself fat, you can be more objective and say, I weigh 189 pounds. And I may not like that, but I don't have to call myself names, okay? And it must be balanced and specific to be believable. So, you know, you may say to yourself, and in some of these talking back rebuttals, I, you know, I don't feel great about my... Um, habit of being late but I'm growing in skills and Jesus will complete his work in me yes Excellent. Thing Excellent. It's listening to me say good things about what God says about me. Yeah, reading verses in front of the mirror. I carry a stack of three by five cards with me just about everywhere I go. I put them on my dash in my car. I put them on my monitor in front of my desk. I'll tape them to my mirror in my bathroom because I need the truth of God. I need the statements. Uh, I need a Godful worldview instead of a godless worldview. So. Uh, we're going to pray and break, but uh, on this sheet that you're going to get is two columns. One is kind of a godless worldview. They're not in your handouts yet. And this is a Godful worldview. So there are going to be statements on the Godful worldview, which says, I am loved, safe, and held secure. I have all I need. Th these are my favorites. There's four pages of these. Some of them you'll like more than others. Grab what you can. Pull favorite verses out of your Bible. Uh, uh, God is love and has totally forgiven me. I'm acceptable. Nothing can separate me from His love. There's nothing to fear. Everything will be okay because of God. My love, faith, and hope changes things. Is that true? 
Does that put you in an empowering place? And a godless worldview would say, I can't be okay. See, massive difference as to what we are putting on our lens and what we're allowing to run along in our conversation. So I'm going to put these handouts over here for you to take. And your assignment this week is to do the love cycle as often as you can. Think of it is to pay attention to your inner dialogue and lead yourself to Jesus and parent yourself and look at these statements and find the ones that really resonate with you where you've been agreeing with a godless worldview and begin to help program into yourself a godful worldview. So let's, let's just pray and wrap this up. can't believe how fast the time goes. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your goodness, Lord, of your word, of your revelation. Uh, we can feel you witnessing in our hearts. We can feel your excitement about what we're learning. That truly, God, you work all things together for our good and for your glory. And nothing can separate us from your love, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we repent from a godless worldview. We repent from allowing this kind of thing thievery to be happening in us so long, but we praise you for awakening us to this theft, and we praise you that you've come to give us life, Lord, and we say yes and embrace that life, and we say yes, and we are excited, Lord, that uh, we do have more influence in these areas than we realized, and we don't have to take the bait. So I pray uh, your cleansing blood over all of us, over our minds, Lord, that we may have the mind of Christ, that we would not be conformed anymore to the ways of the world, or the ways we used to think, but we would be transformed by you by letting you change the way we think, Lord, because then we'll be able to see your beauty and your perfect will for us, and we'll be able to more readily hear your voice and walk with you in our days. And so, Lord, we ask that you be glorified in our thought life, be glorified through our lives. Come soon. The bride says come. The Spirit says come, Lord. And we praise you that your kingdom is unstoppable. We praise you that your promises are infallible and that we can rest in you because you are good and you are love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. Don't forget your handout and your homework. And Lord willing, we'll see you next Wednesday.